The recent removal of fuel subsidy and subsequent price hike has continued to spark concerns among various segments of the society. One particularly affected group is the small and medium enterprises SMEs, which plays a vital role in the country's economy. SMEs form the backbone of Nigeria's economy, contributing to employment generation, economic diversification, and poverty reduction. They often operate on tight budget and are highly sensitive to changes in the cost of doing business. The removal of fuel subsidy has led to an immediate and noticeable increase in operational costs for the SMEs, impacting their ability to remain in business. On the show today, we will keep our eye on the impact of the subsidy removal on small businesses in the wake of the President's move to give 12 million poor households 8,000 naira monthly as palliative. Welcome to Business Insights and Plus TV Africa. I am Justin Akadoni. Before we get into the business of the day, here is a roundup of major business headlines. We begin with the auto gas policy. There are over 9,000 licensed filling stations across the country that are feed for the coal location of facilities that dispense auto gas fuel. The federal government has disclosed this. It disclosed this in a communique issued by the Nigerian Institute of Transport Technology at the end of the stakeholders' engagement forum on the provision of technical manpower and facility for the development and promotion of the auto gas as transportation fuel in Nigeria. The conference with the theme auto gas as an alternative fuel for transportation in Nigeria showed that there was a need for alternative options for transportation fuels such as liquefied natural gas, liquefied petroleum gas, and compressed natural gas known as auto gas, which should become widely used and accepted as an alternative automotive fuel. Moving on now, active subscriptions for the internet across mobile, fixed, and VOIP networks in Nigeria rose to 159.5 million in May this year. According to the latest industry statistics released by the Nigerian Communications Commission, this represents an 8.6% growth when compared with the 158.2 million recorded in April. The NCC's data reveals that the mobile network operators, MTN, Airtel, Globalcom and Nam Mobile maintained their dominance of the internet market with 159 million subscriptions. Now, despite recent criticisms of plans to increase the price of service charges, the Association of Mobile Money and Bank Agents in Nigeria has said current economic conditions have not prompted point of sale operators to reconsider their plans to implement the new framework starting from Monday. This was as it indicated plans to extend the implementation of the new price range to the federal capital territory and other states. On June 30, the PRO of Amban, Lagos chapter Stephen Adeoye, in an interview, said the association had come up with a new price list for POS agents operating in the state. Now, the Director General of the National Information Technology Development Agency, Kashi Inua, says Nigeria's economy can gain $53 billion from the digitization of micro, small, and medium enterprises. Inua said this while delivering an event in Lagos, which was jointly funded by the European Union and the German Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development. The needs that the GE acknowledged that there were challenges that needed to be addressed to realize the potential of digital transformation in SMBs. And that's Business Roundup. We'll take a quick break and return with more to join us again. Welcome from the Business Roundup. SMEs heavily rely on transportation services to move goods and services, both for procurement and distribution. With increased fuel prices, transportation costs have surged, resulting in higher expenses for businesses. This burden is often transferred to the consumers through increased prices of goods and services, further affecting their purchasing power. Joining me uh, right now is the CEO, entrepreneur, NG Mastermind, Believe Iboi. Many thanks for joining us on Business Insight and Plus TV Africa, I Believe. Good morning. Thanks to have you. All right. Uh, okay, so it's been uh, over uh, almost uh, two months since the fuel subsidy removal was announced uh, by President Bola Ahmed Tinubu. In that time, uh, many Nigerians are feeling the brunt. Uh, transportation costs have increased, and of course, the cost of doing business has also increased. Uh, so if you were to analyze, how much would you really say uh, it has affected small business? 
Sincerely, the, the increment in fuel prices has greatly affected practically every sector, especially business owners. Mm. So, like we, we know that as a, as a country, we depend heavily on fuel as a source of power for households, for businesses, or offices, and then majorly for transportation. So, as a result of this, the increment affects basically everything. Now, when cost of transportation is high, yeah, definitely the business owner will have to add extra cost to the to the to the cost of items. Then, because of the fuel prices, you know that uh, businesses' production costs will jump jump high beyond uh, reasonable doubt. So it is it's, it's crazy the way it is right now. Everything is getting more and more and more expensive. And then the next thing we are still holding is no more money again in Nigeria because. The basic things are very can buy and no more buy it for right now. So it is it's not that the experience that people actually want to, to have going forward. And I think government should actually do the right thing by putting a structure in place to regulate to regulate. And the argument has been that with the with the subsidy remover, there's no more regulation. I think that is not true. The government still has the, the power and the resources to still do some prime regulation to ensure that as a there's a level playground for every so you're talking about uh, government and playing an active role in price magazine, but uh, a school of thought would actually say that uh, it is better for you know the economy when the forces of uh, demand and supply actually regulate prices. How do you reason that? Well, it is it's a bit difficult right now for not to say that demand and supply can regulate this. Because we know that uh, the the Federal Marketing Market Act of Oil and the many other oil marketing agencies, they are like a, a group of people that are highly highly organized. So I, as it is, you can just say, for instance, every time the, the price increment, it goes almost at the same day, 24 hours across border. You know that like all this job to sell at the same price. So it is in a system like that where there's an organized body coordinating the affairs of a particular uh, operation, it's very difficult for price of demand and supply uh, to, to take control. So that is why it is important that the higher authority, which is the government, can begin to have play a role in regulating, in stabilizing the prices. So it's always like I said, you know, the time I saw a circular where so where they were like uh, how much the fish you sell per state, legal state have a particular price range, the, the northern now, so, now that, as I think that was done by the Federal Marketers uh, Union or something like that. But the government can tell you that it's okay. Yes, even though you are the one importing this fuel to the country, they know the cost of all of those things. But then there's a profit margin that is okay. You cannot do beyond the social value. That is when it becomes a little bit easy and, uh, and easy for people to now buy at a particular rate. Anything beyond that, it will be very difficult for uh, uh, demand and supply. To control this because it will be very, very difficult. Because there is an organized body that is regulating the affairs of the, of, of the marketers and the fuel stations and all of the oil and gas um, sector. All right, but I still want to uh, probe further concerning uh, the parts uh, or the parts government can actually play in all of this. Because uh, if, for instance, um, the marketers are importing at a particular price, they would actually have to factor in the, you know, the profit margin before they can actually make um, some sort of profit. So if the government is actually telling them what to pay or what to target for, wouldn't it be to their own detriment? No, of course not. Of course not. If, if there is a, a cap on profit margin, no, the I'm not saying the government will say hey, you must. Let's assume it takes a for the, for fuel to be brought into the country. As a businessman, like I said, to sell my fuel at 10 naira to make 9 naira profit, that might be really very, very difficult for us. But if somebody is selling food for 3 naira just because they want to make a 2 naira profit, now naturally, you'll assume that the person who is selling at 9 naira will make more profit. But in the case of the people not buying from that person, the person might not sell much in terms of a volume of sales. And that, that, that is where the good thing is. That is where people are saying that. The cost of a demand and supply should take its, 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 its cost. But we, we know that there is an organized body, the independent marketers and the other three other, four other 
money, but our, our money is really affected from uh, market and rule of those things. So they have a price range already that they are using, and they have the, the, the profit margin is, is there. So it's always a function of how much are you, uh, how, how many volume of uh, fuel are you selling per time. And so that's why it's very difficult for, for me to say that the price of demand and supply should regulate. It will be very, it will be possible because they will not allow it to happen. They will be able to determine the price. And okay. if you look at all the fields, you have what the difference in sales. One era, two era, you see this one selling at 493, 495, one is selling at 496, one is selling at 497 or thereabout. So you notice know that that is what they can do. And that is what they will do. So if you know that price is going a little bit lower, because the government knows what these guys are making, then it is easy for them to now put a benchmark that you cannot do beyond this. You know? And it's just like a guideline that has way uh, as it were. That's how to achieve what I'm talking about right now. All right. Still talking about uh, the fuel subsidy removal. Do you really think uh, the government uh, actually was uh, biting off more than it can chew by removing subsidy and also floating the Naira oil at the same time? Well, the, the government was not biting beyond, beyond its capacity. However, the approach uh, President Tunubu used was very wrong. It was very, very wrong uh, among all factors. Yes, during his campaign period, he would be at Peter Obi and uh, all, all the presidential, even the um, article, all the presidential candidates actually said they were going to remove the fuel subsidy. And they were prepared for it. And, however, it, it, it was uh, the, the approach or the method that was used to remove that fuel subsidy is what is causing these issues we are having right now. So, a, a, a pragmatic approach, a systematic approach that be would be better uh, used instead of the making that announcement all prepared, all rehearsed, and everything. Uh, so I think it was the approach that was adopted to, to remove it that is a problem right now, not the removal itself. Everyone, right from since 2015, that we, people became aware of the subsidy issue, everybody has said, let's remove it. Even though in, in those days, to remove the removal and, and uh, want the removal in, in the first instance. But now that he became the president and he, he saw the need for it to be removed, it has been better if there was a, a more proper systematic approach to removing the subsidy instead of the way it was done. And that was the problem. And that is the problem right now. The way it was removed, not the subsidy itself. All right, uh, just uh, a few days ago, the, uh, the president, and that's Ambola Ahmed uh, Tinubu, announced um, or declared a state of uh, emergency on food security in the country and uh, he directed that all matters uh, pertaining to food and water availability and affordability and essential livelihood items be included within the purview of the National Security Council. Just how far do you think that can go? <laughs> It's not the president, he has the right to declare things. But the truth is, how do you declare an emergency in the food, in, the food, um, in, a, in a agriculture when the major challenge in agriculture is, is the transmission of, of, of food items from the rural areas to the cities, where I are selling our prices and the fuel prices at, at, at an all time high? Would there, would there going to be a, 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 a lower cost for transportation of? If I agree produce, I've been to a couple of northern states in the course of a agree agri businesses trying to uh, train and farmers and all of those things. And I've seen that there, 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 the north, for instance, has a lot of uh, agri produce. For you to be able to remove a cheaper load of, of food produce from the north to Lagos or to any part of the southwest states, it's a lot of distance. And that means a lot of distance and a lot of food that's going to be born for that. So, how do you declare your emergency when? The cost of fuel is high. Those who are producing fertilizers are not producing fertilizers at an all-time high cost. So mm -hmm. it, it, it is a good directive, but I think it, we just need to look at implementation of high strategies. And then by the time you begin to look at how this needs to be implemented, you see that it's not by just declaring. There are factors that make things to work. And if you don't put those factors in place, you cannot get the results you want. And the millennials are sincere, sincere about that. We need to put certain factors in place. Price of fuel needs to be regulated. I'm not saying you pay anybody to do that, they just to put a cap around it. Because every sector has rules that guides it. So, look, and since we know that oil, the oil is Nigeria's uh, major uh, boom and revenue and the source of livelihood, and uh, a lot of um, factors depend on it, government has a say in it. Because government is the people. And anything that affects the people, government will take ownership of that process. 
So we integrate that in the emergency regulatory sector. It's good, but how possible is it? Okay, so how possible is it? I think that that's the question we should ask. Okay, so let's look at another uh, angle right now because a lot of people have actually posited uh, different angles to it and um, different, uh, you know, suggestions. Uh, for instance, uh, they talked about um, incentivizing advising um, maybe small businesses and people uh, who um, uh, actually do business in, sense, in terms of... Uh, instead of uh, you know, regulating uh, the price of um, the petrol, they could also maybe give some sort of um, tax holiday on some um, aspect or sectors of the economy. How far do you really think that can go? Yes, it should go a long way. But if you give me, giving me tax holiday right now, will it do me one thing? It means that I, as a business person, I will make more money. But if you tell me to pay a million dollars for that, let's say, um, a three hundred thousand dollar per annum is on a particular tax, maybe a tax or a pay or all of those things to give me tax holiday. What that means that I, as a business owner, I now have that money with me. But you know, this just does not change the fact that I'm not buying, I'm still buying fuel at high cost. It does not change that my production cost is high. It just means that I am making the money. Everybody that comes to me, the government is not taking anything out of it. One, two, it doesn't mean that the person who is going to buy, it does not make the person to, to buy less. It doesn't mean that person to buy less. So I think for us to be able to have a proper way, it may not be ideal as possible, but that, that, that is the, 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 the human dynamics. You can't, no, no, no approach can appeal well to everybody. So that's why we need to look at it from a perspective of say, let's, yes, I agree that you should give uh, business owners, very those in the informal sector, tax on the days. So it's very good. But then it does not really change anything much. It only really helps the person who is a business owner to make a little bit more money for himself. And then you cannot put that money to the to to, to augment yeah. your other uh, costs involved in operations. Okay, so uh, just um, um, a few days ago, towards the end of uh, last week, uh, the president uh, uh, made a request to the National Assembly, uh, you know, to approve um, about um, five hundred million dollars, so uh, they can give eight uh, thousand uh, naira monthly to about uh, twelve million households for the next um, six months, uh, you know, because. Uh, over time, uh, Labour and the president had a meeting, or the presidency had a meeting, you know, and they had like an eight week to resolve uh, the issue of um, palliatives and uh, to cushion the effect of uh, the fuel subsidy removal. In your opinion, how far do you really think uh, this um, 8,000 there for 12 million households, you know, in six months uh, can go to cushion the effect on small business and, of course, some um, households? <laughs> And then when you listen to a lot of these things that the government are pushing us, we begin to wonder who is advising people to do these things. Now, by, by, by calculations, I saw that uh, that means that uh, a lot of people get between the range of uh, 8,000 euro per month. Okay, six months. You know what is, uh, pardon? Yes, 8,000 and then for about six months, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So what can you buy with that? If you transport from your house to, let's take a, a typical equation, and, and uh, most times, like we know, Lagos, states like Lagos do not have access to things like that. So, you do not know of those monies are given to people in the core northern states because they are assumed to be less privileged, less privileged things and all of those things. But let's look at other states, even in the north. The cost of transport is high. North is buying fuel in a more high, in higher price right now because I see from data that people go to the north to buy fuel. I don't know, that's just something because for you to be troubling with them. So if you get a thousand per month per household, is 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 does not really make sense before we standard one. So if you give the money to the people who let me be very poor, what about the person who is producing? Where are, so who's going to receive this money in the first instance? So if well, unless we to create a balance, you are giving but eight thousand dollars even is is even out of it in the first in the first equation. Is out of it. Eight thousand is out of it. Okay. But what we what we should look into should be things that have to do with um, empowerment. 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 In terms of how, what what kind of empowerment yeah, are you talking about? And that's what I'm trying to say. When I say empowerment, I'm trying to okay. People need to now begin to okay. I need to know how to make things. I need to know how to create things. I need to know how to make things. So if you empower people to to be self-employed and you give them money to, to empower their businesses, 
empower their businesses. And it is easy. It's easy. It's everywhere, generally, the economy dynamic is, is complex. So as we are giving to the people who want to buy, we also need to use the people who are also producing. And then we also look at, need to look at labor unions who are now advocating for six-fold uh, increments of their salary, which doesn't really make any sense anyway. Because if you increase salary for the labor union, which are basically majorly people in the government sectors who are the, you know, people that actually make up the, the, the labor unions. But you, you will notice, however, that the same formula cannot apply to the different structures of these people I'm, I'm, I'm referring to. The very, very poor, who are supposed not to have bank accounts and all of those things, then the people who have been able to uh, create more business for themselves that make up the formal sector that drives the economy. Now, those ones, yeah, like we said earlier on, cannot have tax breaks, cannot have some basic reforms, grants, not the rules, but grants given to them to remain. And the government taking intentional actions to reduce the price of fuel, to regulate, I don't think it's going to reduce, to regulate the price of fuel. So that's how there's, there's a cap and a benchmark within. And then, so you, you, you notice that at every level of the structure you're trying to deal with, it's going to require a different approach. So from a business perspective, that is what makes it work. But in terms of policy, I mean, I don't know about policy now. I don't want to say I know about policy anyway, it goes. But however, in terms of business, that is how it should work. So that every uh, niche, or when I use the word niche, I'm referring to every structure of the economy we want to focus on, yeah. we have specific solutions, not this one, one move fits all approach yeah. that has been uh, uh, adopted. All right, uh, we must say a very big thank you to you, believe Iboy, for finding time to you know share all of um, this uh, useful <coughs> input with us on Business Insight. We do appreciate your time. Thank you so much. All right. As we go on the show, the newly inaugurated president of the Institute of Chartered Secretaries and Administrators of Nigeria, Iksan Fumi Akudayo, has promised to promote good corporate governance. She spoke during her investiture uh, at Lagos, which was attended by high-profile people from the nation's public and private sectors. I'll leave you with details of that. I am Justin Akadoni. I'll see you again next time. Gathered in this hall are friends and families of the 29th president of the Institute of Chartered Secretary and Administrators, Iksen Fumi Ekudayo. They felicitate with her as she emerges the first female president of the body after 57 years. During her acceptance speech, Ekudayo acknowledges the contributions of the founding fathers of the Institute and pledges to take the professional body to greater heights. I have no other duty or responsibility from this moment and onward but to lead and leave Ixan stronger, greater and more prosperous than we met it. In a keynote address, the managing director of Lotus Merchant Bank, Kafilat Araoye speaks on diversity, inclusiveness, and corporate governance as tools for sustainable development. If the board does well, institutions get stronger and more productive, leading to long-term sustainable development. It is important, however, in all this, not to compromise competence. I get out where people say, oh, you got a chance because you, cov you cover the, a, 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 um, a quota system. No. It still must be merit-driven, even in a bid to achieve diversity and inclusiveness. Equal opportunity for all is all we're saying. Special advisor to the President on Monetary Policy, Adebayo Olawale Edun, and other dignitaries charge Ixen to contribute more towards national economic growth and development. Mrs. Fumi Ekundayo, one of the most diligent, one of the most enterprising people that you can find. You have pioneered a novel occurrence in the history of the Institute, which is highly applaudable. Araoye posited that in Nigeria, the quota system originally designed to promote diversity and fair representation has on occasions led its promoters to compromise incompetence. Thus, corporate organizations must be mindful of such mistake. The 29th president of Ixan speaks more. At Ixan, it is also built in such a way that subsequent governments build on existing legacies, which we plan to do. And there are a lot of other areas of focus that we also have as an administration. One of those areas is to actually continue to strengthen the capacity of our members to continue to deliver value 
to different ecosystems and different value chains across the spectrum of private and public um, environments, particularly at this critical stage that we are as a nation, when we're trying to rebuild, we're trying to, you know, uh, reset. Ekundayo has shows of Eastern's commitment to promoting good corporate governance in the country at all times.